Well, thank you for that introduction. I can hardly wait to hear what I'm going to say now. <laughs> yes, indeed, um, Gary and I are near neighbours and we see each other most mornings. Um, as he said, I run and he walks. We're both heading for the grave. Well, I guess the guy who runs gets there first, eh? <laughs> and yes, we enjoyed the games of cricket in the backyard. Uh, many years later, Gary, I came back to that same house that I used to live in next door to you uh, as the pastor of the Mowbray Church. And by that time, I had my own kids of uh, around about uh, nine, eight, nine, around about there. And we used to play cricket in the backyard. They were postage stamp size yards, so there wasn't much space for cricket. So we had to play, we didn't play with uh, proper cricket balls, of course. Uh, we played with tennis balls, and when we lost all the tennis balls, I remember once we even played with a golf ball. Um, but uh, tennis balls themselves could be pretty bad to play with. I remember once in the kitchen, the kitchen window faced the backyard, and my wife was standing at the kitchen sink washing dishes, and I was batting. And I hit the ordinary tennis ball, but in such a way that it just hit the window pane in the right spot to break the window pane right in my wife's face. Uh, we had to uh, give up cricket for a whole week while she got over that. But anyway, how can you stay too long without cricket? So um, yeah, it's great to be with you this afternoon. And thank you for the invitation, Byron, to be with uh, this beautiful group of people, God's people, God's family, uh, here at UTS. As you've heard already, we are talking today about the world's biggest but now, unfortunately, the resolution is not quite right. Excuse me, uh, yeah. Use the handle mic. Yeah. Oh, we've got another mic, haven't we? That's fine. Yes, I'll use that one. Are we on that channel? Yes, we are indeed. I can hear that. We've got a bit of a problem with the resolution, and I hope it comes right, because you'll notice as you see, if you ever do see the title on the screen, that it's not that sort of but that we're talking about. There's only one T in the word but. Not two. <laughs> the world's biggest but. If I could come here with an open uh, menu as to what I could talk about, there'd be so many things I could really want to share with you. Some of the biggest questions that you might have, and I do get asked so many questions in my ministry. So many times people are asking me questions about all sorts of things. What's going to happen when we die, you know? When will Jesus come? Um, all sorts of questions like that. Uh, how do I handle life? Very good questions. But probably the biggest question that was ever asked was asked by a, a, a prison warden at the dead of night. In Acts chapter 16 and verse 30, we read the verse and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? It's a question that comes a few times in the Bible. And uh, one of the times is where a man came to Jesus one day and said, uh, Master, what should I do to have eternal life? Same sort of question. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to have eternal life? The most important question that was ever asked. It's the question behind every other question that counts. And it's a question we need to be able to answer for ourselves. If someone were to come to you just out of the blue and say, please tell me, I see you're a Christian. What must I do to be saved? What would you say to that person? It's all right, just leave it. Yeah, we've got it. There we are. One T in butt, okay? How would you answer that question for the person who asks you? Would you know what you say? Do you know the answer for yourself? Have you actually answered that question for yourself? Do you know for sure that if you should die this very day, you'd be saved? Do you know the answer to that question? What must I do to be saved? Well, some people say, can we really know whether or not we are saved? Should we be able to know? Do we have the right to believe that we are saved? Well, while you're thinking about that, look what John said in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. He said, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may what? Know that you have eternal life. 
And I would like that when we leave through those doors at the end of this hour, that you'll be able to go out saying, yes, I know that I have eternal life. Would you like to be able to be doing that? Oh, yes. And to know it for sure. So the great news is that we can know it. We can know that we have eternal life. But now, that's something we need to explore. How can I know it? And before I get into the good news about this, we've got to explore the bad news. And let me tell you, the bad news is really bad. And in fact, we've got to pre appreciate how bad the bad news is. Because if I don't understand how bad the bad news is, I'll never really appreciate how good the good news is. So let's, let's look at the bad news. One day in his most famous sermon, known as the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said these startling words. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What sort of people call Jesus Lord, by the way? Muslims? Buddhists? Who calls Jesus Lord today? Christians. People who believe in Jesus. Now we've just read from John that he said those who believe in Jesus may know that they have eternal life. And yet, yeah, Jesus says, not everyone who calls me Lord is actually going to make it to heaven. In fact, he's talking about some really extraordinary Christians. Because he goes on to say, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? I mean, these aren't ordinary Christians. I mean, who have you recently cast a demon out of somebody, may I ask? Or performed a miracle? Anybody? I mean, these are really special Christians. What we call first-class Christians. <laughs> And yet Jesus says of, of them, then will I say to them, plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Why? Because it says, they did not do the will of my Father who is in heaven. So how perfectly should we be doing the will of God before we can know for sure we've got eternal life? Can any of us really be doing it perfectly? While you're thinking about that, read Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 where it says, There is no one who is righteous, not even one. Not even one. And it says in verse 23, All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. It's like trying to shoot an arrow with a wet bowstring. And the arrow just always just falls short, falls short, falls short. Never makes it, never reaches it. Aims in the right direction, but just never reaching there. And it says that's how we are. We're just never getting there. And the reason is given in Romans chapter 8, verse 7, where it says that it's because the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. There's a basic breakdown between ourselves and the law of God. We know what is right, and we aim in that direction, but we're always falling short. And in fact, there's something inside of us that even rebels against it at times. There's a hostility, it says, between our natural selves and the law of God. Of course, it is possible for a young man growing up in a good Christian home, pure and clean and upright, was able to look at those Ten Commandments and say, well, look, I don't worship other gods, I don't bow to idols, I, I, don't tell, I don't take God's name in vain, I keep the Sabbath, I keep on my father and mother, I, keep, I, I do this, I do it. Ten out of ten. Hmm. It is possible to do that. Until we read Jesus' definition, his explanation of the Ten Commandments, in that same famous Sermon on the Mount. He says to his audience something that absolutely shakes them out of their sandals. 
in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 19, he says, verse 20 rather, he says, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, hey, the Pharisees, do you know anything about them? We don't give them very good headlines when we talk about the Pharisees, do we? And yet they were the best guys in the land. The, the, the teachers of the law were the guys who took basically the Old Testament and looked at the laws that are given in the Old Testament, listed them all, and then broke them down into every possible situation of life that they could think of. So for instance, on the Sabbath, the fourth commandment, in their Mishnah that eventually was developed just after Jesus, that was actually written down as the Mishnah, they had 24 chapters just on the Sabbath as to what you should do and what you should not do. And it was very precise and very demanding. For instance, they read in the Old Testament, do not carry any burdens on the Sabbath day. Well, what's a burden? Well, a burden they decided was anything that weighed more than a dried fig. So you're not allowed to carry around anything that weighed more than a dried fig. If, you, if late Friday afternoon you're walking around the house chewing on an apple and suddenly the bells begin to ring to say the Sabbath has come, sit down, don't walk around with that apple. You're carrying a burden. Don't wear shoes with nails in because those nails weigh more than a dried fig. That's working on the Sabbath. That's carrying a burden. You mustn't eat any eggs that the hens laid on the Sabbath because those poor hens work very hard getting that, that egg out of the system. Of course, you don't want to lose the monetary value of it. You can sell it to a Gentile the next day, but you mustn't eat it. Yeah? Don't walk through a field on the Sabbath because your feet might actually kick some seeds out of the grass. That's harvesting on the Sabbath. So you can see Jesus was up against it because he actually healed people on the Sabbath. Now the Pharisees, those were the, the, the teachers of the law that delineated all these laws. The Pharisees, they were the ones who actually looked at those laws and actually tried to keep them all. They were very precise in their, in their way they wanted to obey God. They were very serious about it. They really took their religion seriously. You'd love to have this place full of Pharisees. Serious. Because they really took their religion seriously. They were regarded as the top notch, and they saw themselves that way, as the best of the best in the land. And everybody was kind of judged by the religion of the Pharisees. Good guy. And yet, yet Jesus comes along and he says to his ordinary people audience, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you're not going to make it. You're not going to get a look in to heaven. You can imagine how the ordinary Jews heard that and said, what chance do we stand there? But in saying this, Jesus was not saying you've got to do more than the Pharisees do. What he was really saying is, they don't go deep enough. And one of the things he condemned about the Pharisees was that it was all external. They wore their religion on their shirt sleeves. And so this is what he says now in the next verse, verse 21. And on into verse 22, we'll read in a moment. He says, you have heard it was said long ago, you shall not kill. Where does that come from? That's one of the Ten Commandments, yes. You shall not kill. Hands up those of you that have broken this one. <laughs> well, I shouldn't really be asking you, or else you might get reported to the cops. So we're all right on this one, eh? We can tick that one off. Until we read what Jesus says about that commandment. This is what he goes on to say. And he says, of course, if you've broken that, you'll be in danger of of, of uh, judgment for sure but now listen to what he says but I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment 
In other words, what Jesus is saying is not just a matter of actually taking a gun and shooting somebody. Even if you're angry with somebody, you harbor that anger against that person. You're breaking the commandment that says, you shall not kill. We read on, because he carries on, showing it a little bit more, to be deeper than just the letters, thou shalt not kill. He goes on to say, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. Now, Raka was an expression of despising somebody, labeling somebody negatively, you fool, you idiot, that sort of thing. And of course, the Sanhedrin, they were the highest law court in, in, in uh, Israel. About 70 carefully chosen men who were the last court of appeal, as it were. And you could take someone to court for calling you Raka. But Jesus says it's far more serious than that, actually. Because he goes on to say, but I tell you that anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. <coughs> when we give people labels like that, we treat them accordingly. I mean, what do they do with nerds in high school? They bully them. Yeah. Back in Africa, we were really good at giving people who are of a different race a bad label. And we treat them accordingly. It would distance us from them. It would depersonalize them. During the Second World War, and any war, the propaganda machine includes giving a label, a dehumanizing label to the enemy. And so the British were not fighting Germans. I mean, Germans are nice people. They were fighting the Huns. They were fighting Nazis. It's not nice to kill a German, but it's okay to kill a Nazi. You see? The label depersonalizes. And it gives you permission to kill. So Jesus says, it's not just a matter of thou shalt not kill. Being angry enough to kill. And having this attitude towards other people that depersonalizes, dehumanizes them, degrades them, is breaking this commandment. You get him? You understand what Jesus is saying? You see, what he's saying is it's not just what you actually do on the outside, it's what goes on on the inside. I mean, that becomes really clear when we go to verses 27 and 28 where he says, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. I'm not going to ask for your hands up on this one. Do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her where? In his heart. It may never actually become something you do on the outside. But it's what goes on on the inside that God is seeing. And for which God condemns. <coughs> Somehow we think that if, that, that if we can just keep our sins, you know, in the secret, secrets of our minds and our hearts, it's not so bad. But Jesus says that's especially what the, where the problem is. And you can modify your behavior through long years of, of practice, you know. Be a really good Christian on the outside. But your heart stays the same. You cannot change your heart. You can change your behavior, but you cannot change your heart. Our brokenness is not just in our misbehavior. Our brokenness goes to the very core of our being. And if we're ever going to be in health, that's where we've got to be in health. What do you reckon? Somehow things have to be changed deep down inside of us. And not just in the pretenses of our behavior. And the worst news of all comes in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. The wages of sin is dead. So what this is saying, and this is the bad news, and the bad news is really bad. Please don't leave now because we're about to turn the corner on this one. But the bad news is this. Jesus says, unless we do the will of God 
and it can't be less than perfect for God. There's no way we're going to get a look in into heaven. But we don't have it to give. We're broken people. We can pretend, we can try, we can get a lot of our behavior right, but deep down inside of us, at the very core of our being, sin is still harbored. It still seems to rule the day. And every now and then it bursts in, bursts out in our behavior, like some volcanic eruption that suddenly happens. And everybody around us is shocked. They shouldn't be, because it's my natural self coming to the fore. That's who I am. And I'm not going to make it to heaven as that sort of broken person. That's the bad news. Remember my mother saying to me once, and I didn't grow up in a Christian home, we weren't Christians. Um, but my mother once said to me, oh, it's all right, as long as I'm not in the dark. <laughs> it's pretty bad when the preacher's in the dark. Uh, my mother once said to me, oh, my boy, there's no way I'm ever going to get to heaven. I said, mother, no way. Surely you're, you're going to get to heaven. She said, no, I'll just never be good enough. And you know, she was right. The fact is that not one of us will ever be good enough for heaven. That's the bad news. We'll never be good enough to deserve heaven. And that's why God says, okay, let's not talk about deserving. Let's talk about something else. And this is where the good news comes in. At the very point where the bad news is at its worst, the wages of sin is death, there's actually good news. I want you to notice that in this verse, Romans 6 verse 23, there isn't a full stop after the word death. Death is not the final word in God's vocabulary. That's not the end of the story. In fact, there's a comma after the word death. And the full verse reads this. The wages of sin is death, but, and this is the world's biggest but, it makes all the difference between life and death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. That's good news, isn't it? Hallelujah. Amen. It's the best news that ever was. And that but stands, sits on the line between life and death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. What's the difference between wages and, and gift? What's wages? Something. It's something you earn. And and it's your right, isn't it? I mean, if you've worked hard for a fortnight, you're expected at the end of the fortnight to get your wages, right? And if you don't get it, you'll be most upset. It's what you deserve. The wages of sin is death. You've worked hard at it. <laughs> it's what you deserve. And it's all you'll ever deserve. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the gift of God. And what's a gift? How much do you pay for the gift that you get? He paid for it already. If you paid anything for a gift that is given to you, it wouldn't be a gift. It wouldn't be a gift. It would have to be free to you. If it's going to be a gift, right? A gift is a gift is a gift. And you've got to remind yourself of this every day. God is saying, okay, the wages that you deserve will never be eternal life. You'll never deserve it. So I'm offering it to you as a gift. Now, of course, somebody pays for a gift. Somebody pays for it, unless they stole it. <laughs> Here it tells us who paid for it. The gift of God is eternal life, how? Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And because of something Jesus did, something about Jesus, means that you have eternal life offered to you as a gift. As a gift. As a gift. So what is it about Jesus that we can have eternal life? It goes. I just want to take you back to where we 
we started earlier on in 1 John chapter 5, we read verse 13, that to you who believe that you may know that you have eternal life. Look at verses 11 and 12, where it says, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. But he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. That's the bottom line of what we're talking about this afternoon. If you have Jesus, what do you have with him? You have life. But if you do not have Jesus, no matter what else you have going for you, you do not have life. It hinges on what you do with Jesus. What do you do with Jesus? That's the question that answers the question. What must I do to be saved? So what is it about Jesus that gives us the right to have eternal life simply by having Jesus? He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. What did Jesus do that gives us the right to have life offered to us as a gift. What did he do? I knew you'd say that. Yes, firstly he died for us. On the cross, there's a beautiful prophecy in Isaiah chapter 53. 600 years before Jesus died, the veil was pulled aside to tell us the meaning of his death. It was not obvious, it was not self-evident that day as people stood there seeing him die. But there was a prophecy 600 years before the time that actually said what it was going to mean for everybody. And this is what it says. He was pierced for our transgression, crushed for our iniquity. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's what happened on Calvary. We would never have known what it was all about, except that long before the time, the Bible was <coughs> predicting the event and saying what it was going to actually be about pierced for our sins, crushed for our iniquities. What we deserve, he took upon himself, so that what he deserves, we could have. He died the death which was ours, so we could have the life which is his. That's the exchange that was made on Calvary. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, it says there that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we who know nothing but sin might be made the righteousness of God. I mean, wow! To become the righteousness of God. What could be less perfect or more perfect than the righteousness of God? Isn't that amazing? Amen. So when God looks at you on the basis of this, he would be able to say, I see someone who is as righteous as me, myself. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Amen. It happened because of cro the cross. This is what happened when Jesus died. He became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Let me try and illustrate that for you, explain it. Imagine that everybody who's ever lived on this earth is alive right now, and we get all placed there together on uh, somewhere out in the outback where it's nice and flat and lots of room. So we're all standing there together in the outback, shoulder to shoulder. And written above our heads is one word that describes us universally. Sinners, because the way, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we're all standing there, sinners over our head. But there standing in our midst is one man, Jesus Christ. And he looks up to heaven. He has one man 
who never ever sinned. In fact, the Bible says in him was no sin. To the very core of his being, there was nothing of that brokenness that you and I experience. And he stands there and he looks up to heaven and he says, Father, gather, gather all the sins of all these people of all time. Gather all their sins and place them on my head. Treat me as though I had actually committed all those sins so that you can treat them as though they've never ever sinned, just like me. Amen. That's what happened on Calvary. Mm -hmm. just, just picture that. There's Jesus hanging on that cross as darkness gathers around it. All nature is kind of sympathizing with him in this moment. The people standing at the foot of the cross don't really know what's going on. At best, they would be seeing a good man dying unjustly. At worst, they would be associating themselves with those who are saying, ha, look at him, he couldn't even save himself, and yet he wants to save other people. And it was true that what they were saying. He could not save himself and save us at the same time. The darkness gathers around him so thickly that he cries out, using the words of Psalm 22, verse 1. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt totally God forsaken. You can say he was entering into hell for us at that moment, because that's what hell would be like. This total God forsakenness, crushing the life out of him pierced for our iniquities, crushed for our transgressions. But in that act of dying like that, taking our sins upon himself, he was giving us once again the option of standing before God just as if we had not sinned. The wages of sin is death, and he took it upon himself. So we could have once again the gift of eternal life. Not only did he die for us, he also lived a perfect life in our place. I love Romans chapter 5 and verse 19, which actually says it. It says, through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. And through the obedience through the, of the one man, the many were made righteous. Now, through the disobedience of the one man, who would that be? Adam. That would be Adam, the head of the human race. And in a strange way, the Bible says that we stand guilty basically because of Adam's sin. We're part of the human tribe, and the head of the tribe carries responsibility for the whole tribe. That's the way the Bible reckons things in a pretty holistic way. So the head of this human tribe, Adam, chose to turn away from God to follow another. And the human race was basically placed into that situation where they were out of tune with God. And through his disobedience, the many, that you and me, are made sinners. But just so also, the converse is wonderfully true. Through the obedience of the one man. And who would that be? That would be Jesus, whom the New Testament calls the second Adam. And he never ever sinned. He was pure through and through and through. And so through the obedience of the one man, the many are made righteous. You're not made righteous before God by your obedience. It will never be good enough. You are actually made righteous with God through the obedience of another. The obedience of Jesus is written over to you, to your account, as though it was your actual obedience. And you stand before God today as you believe in Jesus, as you accept Him as your Savior. You stand before God covered, as it were, in that perfect obedience of Jesus. And God sees you that way. 
<laughs> your wife won't see you that way, that's for sure. <laughs> but God sees you that way, and that's what really counts, isn't it? There's a third marvelous thing that God does. I know that you don't, I mean, you're, you're so happy that Jesus died for you. You're so glad to know that his perfect life is written over to you as though it was yours. So there's one more thing you want. You want the deep down healing that will make you into a new person. And Ezekiel chapter 36 and verses 26, 27 says that's exactly what God will do for you. A new heart will I give you. I'll put a new spirit in you. I'll take that stony, rock-hard heart out of you and I'll give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my ways, my decrees, and to be careful to keep my laws. Notice how many times it says, I will. If you read the preceding verses and the verses that come after, you'll count about seven or eight times where it's God saying, I will, I will, I will. God takes responsibility for any change that happens in you. He says, I'll do it. I'll give you a new heart. I'm going to start healing you from the inside out. And that's the problem with the Pharisees. They try to get right from the outside in. They thought if they could only get their behavior right, they'd be right with God. If they could only do it for long enough and do enough of it, they'd get right with God. God says, I'm going to start on the inside. I'm going to clean you up on the inside. And there'll be an outward flow that happens. It's going to change you from the inside. And you're going to become, you're going to, by my spirit living in you, you will actually then keep my Lord. You'll do what is right. Your life will come right. You'll be a new person. Or it says, it says in the New Covenant, which is quoted from Jeremiah in Hebrews chapter 8 uh, and verse 10, it says, I'll put my laws in their mind. I'll write them in their hearts. It's the work of the Holy Spirit to do that. What it means is, and you know it, you know that behind all God's laws is one word. Love. Jesus said, love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. And then it adds, on these two laws hang every other law and every other writing by the prophets. So all it comes together in this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. And the Holy Spirit is the one who implants in us this love. The fruit of the Spirit, it says in Galatians 5 verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is the very first word, love. And it goes on with joy and peace and, and other fruit, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. And because the Holy Spirit mysteriously and miraculously changes you into a person who loves, loves God, loves people, that law is now being inscribed into the very flesh of your heart and becomes more the inclination of your life. And that's what he's doing in you. Sometimes we live too close to ourselves to see it. But God is changing you. Do you know that? Maybe you're not the person you should be. But praise God, you're not the person you used to be. God is changing you. Is working on the inside where you cannot change. As I said earlier, you can change your behavior, but you cannot change your heart. But God can. I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will actually cause you to walk in my decrees and to keep my law. I will do it, he said. He's doing it, my friend. Believe it. Because he said it. He's doing it for you. And in you. And in the meantime, even though you haven't arrived, God sees you as perfect in Jesus. So you can die right now. And you know your place is fixed in heaven. You have eternal life. Of course, now there is our part. And what is our part? Well, firstly, obviously, we've got to believe it all. We've got to believe it. In answer to that question that was asked, the question with which we started, 
in Acts chapter 16, verse 30. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The answer that he was given by Paul in verse 31 is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe and you will be saved. Of course, we've got to believe it. It's as easy as that. <laughs> it's as hard as that. Because it's so hard to just believe it. We always want to kind of put ourselves on probation to prove after a few days that we're really genuine about it. God is not waiting for that. All He's waiting is for you to believe it. He says, that's enough. I'm applying to you everything that I've promised. All the things you've been talking about this afternoon. It's yours. Because you believe it. Believe it and it becomes reality. The second thing we must do, of course, is to confess. Now this is basically confronting our brokenness. You know that every sin I commit is an expression of my brokenness. And so I come talking to God about it. Well, why does he want me to confess when he already knows? Well, it's a matter of me coming to terms with it. Or me getting honest with myself and calling it by its right name. I mean, we call sin by all sorts of wonderful names. You know, we whitewash it. We even entertain ourselves with it as we watch TV and these sitcoms and so on. And it's all about sin and we laugh and we... We're entertained. God hates it. Every one of those things is destroying us. And he wants us to own up to it. So put it out there where we can now deal with it, he says. So we confess it and we say, God, I acknowledge that this thing I've done is sin. I cannot excuse it and I cannot rationalize it and I cannot pretend it's not as bad as, as you said it is. I own up to it. Please forgive me. And this is what his promise is in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins, and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness, purify us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that marvelous? Believe it. Believe it. That when you confess it, you're not going to feel it. You're not going to feel like, you're not going to be zapped by some light from heaven. You're not going to suddenly feel everything is just hunky-dory now. You've got to believe it because he has promised it. And when you believe it, it becomes reality. And then thirdly, we must choose. We must choose. In other words, having now laid it out before God, said this thing I'm doing is not right, we then choose not to continue doing it. We want to walk with Jesus. We want to be in partnership with him. And it says in 1 John 2 verse 4 that the man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in him. If we're really serious about this thing, we've got to make some hard choices. We can't play games with God here. Those things are destroying us. Let's get real. And let's say to him, God, I admit I still love doing that thing. Don't fool yourself on that one. I mean, that's why you do them. Temptations are only temptations because you actually enjoy doing those things. I mean, you're not tempted to eat sawdust, are you? But you are tempted to drink and eat some stuff that really tastes good to you, but you know they're not good for you. So you've got to make some hard choices. You've got to say, having labelled that thing sin, you've got to now make a choice and say, God, I choose not to continue doing that. Now, simply saying that doesn't mean to say you suddenly are not going to be doing it anymore. It doesn't work that way. Our sins are our habits. And they're deeply ingrained in our neuromuscular system. And sometimes it takes having to confess that same thing a hundred times before you finally wake up one day and realize, hey, it's no longer part of my thinking. That's how sometimes it works. But you keep making the choice to do it God's way. And he says, I'll be there for you. 
There's a wonderful picture given in Revelation chapter 3. A picture of, of Jesus standing there, knocking on the heart's door. And this is what it says in Revelation 3 verse 20. It says, look, I stand at this door knocking. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. And I'll eat with him. And he with me. You eat with people who are your friends, don't you? You people from the islands know how to do that. <coughs> you establish family and friendship around the food table. <coughs> Jesus is saying, we'll be mates. In fact, we'll be family. Just let me in. Do you hear him knocking? Every day. Every verse we've just read is a knock at the door. Jesus knocking. Can you see him standing there as close? As close as you can get. And you kind of feel this is it. It's time. I need to open the door to Jesus. I need to allow him into my life. I need him to be the Lord of my life. I've tried so hard and failed so miserably. I need a strength from outside of myself. I need someone who has the power to change me. And he's promised he'll do it. So I know he wants to. Dear Jesus, right now we are hearing the knock. Your gentle knock at our heart's door. You're too much of a gentleman to come barging your way in. You're not going to force your way into our life. That's why you knock. We hear the knock. We can see you standing close by. It's just you and you and me now. It's that personal. And Lord, we just feel that this is it. This is the moment. We want to say the big yes to you. So right now we say it, Lord Jesus, come into our hearts, come into our lives. And we thank you that as you do that, you bring with you every benefit that you have promised, and with it all, eternal life. We thank you, we praise your name, amen, amen. Thank you for letting me share with you the greatest news that ever came to this world. It's good news, isn't it? Great news. God bless you each other.